I want to preach today from this subject because of what Jesus did. Because of what Jesus did. Father, may we do no damage to the word, but preach that which becomes sound doctrine and gospel. We ask that you would save the soul that's near as hell today. Deliver the lost, O oh God. Strengthen the saved. Give us power, O oh God to do your will in Jesus name amen because of what Jesus did walk worthy of the vocation wherein you ye are called and we can do this because of what Jesus did this is a day of victory today this is victory day I want to name this victory day Victory over the devil. Victory over situations. Victory over sickness. Victory over sin. We can walk in. We can obtain victory today. We can claim it. We can live it. We can realize it because of what Jesus did. There are three things that Christ did that I want to highlight today the Bible tells us that there are so many things that Christ did when he walked the earth that if we name them all the world itself could not contain the books that should be written John wrote that about Jesus Christ isn't that amazing you talking about a, a earthly ministry and a life that our Lord led doing his earthly sojourn that John closes out uh, his gospel uh, with the book that bears his name and uh, John uh, 21 and uh, uh, 25 says and there are also many other things which Jesus did the which if they should be written every one I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written amen what a ministry what a life. You're talking about busy and getting it done. Our Lord and Savior, uh, during his earthly ministry, had an amazing ministry. And, uh, and my heart, uh, Prophet Holly, uh, certainly goes out to the disciples who followed him. And now I understand why he told his disciples, take your leisure. He said, take a rest. So there's been much goings and comings. Because in following Jesus, they had a job to do just to be able to keep up. That was very little dead time in following Christ. As a matter of fact, they were so tired that he told him, I want you to watch with me one hour while I pray. He went to pray. They fell asleep. They were worn out. The Bible teaches one time he ministered so that the people thought he was mad because it didn't even take time to eat. He knew that his time was short and he had a whole lot to do. Just a few months away from the cross, just a few months, six months away, he takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, stands in a location with multiple gods, false gods erected behind him and looked at his disciples and said, uh, whom do men say that I am? And who do you say that I am? I need to know because I'm close to the end of my journey and I need to know whether or not you know who I am because I got to take my leave. Isn't that something? What a mighty God we serve. A mighty God. But today I can't preach about all those things because if I preached them all, you'd be gone. And uh, it would take my lifetime to try to preach them all. And since the Bible didn't even list them all, so we're going to deal with just three things today that um, I want to highlight. The three things are his incarnation, his resurrection, and his ascension. His incarnation, incarnate mean literally to come in the flesh resurrection to be raised from the dead and his ascension that he went back to heaven on the basis of these three his incarnation his resurrection and his ascension because Jesus did these things the believer has been given power to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called we can do this we can live this life. 
We can represent Jesus properly. We can walk in victory in this day and time. With all the things that are going on, we can live holy. We can be a holiness church. Seems like to me of late, every time the church is on television and is on display, the church drops the ball. You would think, uh, and may she rest in peace. I hope she was saved. But you would think that Aretha Franklin found a cure to cancer. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and all kinds of diseases. Uh, and, and when in reality, she was an entertainer. A church girl that left the church and sang uh, 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 sensuous songs and sold a lot of songs. And, 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 and she lived and she died. I hope that she got saved. But I do know this. We have to be guardians of decency and standards in our church. Uh, um, at the Upper Room Church, uh, the, the young lady, uh, no one would have ever gotten to the pulpit uh, in a, a skirt like that. That's not proper. That's not, that's not, that's not in line with decency. And, I, and I'll say this for uh, the young lady. I guarantee you, had she been invited to go to the White House, invited to perform at the governor's mansion, invited to perform anywhere else, she wouldn't have gone dressed like that. She would have showed more respect for the venue. It is apparent that she didn't know that she was on her way to church. And if she, and if she did know, then it, that, that showed no respect. But if the world don't respect the church, the church ought to respect itself and say, you can't do that here. Amen. And no man whose God is not the Lord should be allowed to sit in the pulpit of a church. Louis Farrakhan would never sit in this pulpit. Never. That, that's, that wouldn't happen. Now, I'm not saying he couldn't come. I'd let him come to church. Everybody's welcome to come. Uh, the young lady's welcome to come, but I'm talking about be on program. Stand here where the sacred gospel is preached. Oh, no, there has to be a standard. Amen. And where there is no standard, there is no standard. And things just, desecrations take place. Oh, you don't like what I'm saying. Well, Pastor, you don't know. That could have been the only skirt she had. That girl is rich. She's rich. She can buy, she can buy her any skirt she wants and you any skirt you want. Yeah, she's rich. Just, just a matter of disrespect. And then the preacher, I don't know him personally, but instead of uh, being a man of God and bringing in proper correction, he gets up and make fun of the girl's name, which was not right. That's right. And then, you know, uh, I, I don't think it's appropriate to right. reach out and grab somebody like that. That's right. Amen. So uh, the problem comes when we try to be too much like the world. So we're the church. We're the church. The church is not the world. And you can't win the world. I said this in leadership. You can't win the world being enamored by the world. If you're just, you're standing there in awe because you see a worldly singer or a movie star, well, and, uh, and well, you can't tell them about Jesus because you're in awe of them. Jesus is the one that we adore. Amen. When I got saved and got in holiness, my, the stars in my life were the preachers. I want to be like Elder Turner. Amen. Bishop this one, Bishop that one. Those who carried the word of the Lord. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Uh, 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 there, there has to be a standard. Without the standard, we will be in trouble. And I want to say this to all of you who serve in the church. Help us with the standard. It would be, that would be nice. You got mirrors. We all have mirrors. We all know what is appropriate. We all know what is not. Say amen. 
and see the truth is things like what we saw on full display at that funeral don't happen overnight. Things inch up. See, they get a little tight over time. So you want to be careful. And I know, let me go on and preach, because I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, we don't want to hear anything about clothes. Well, sometimes you got to say something about clothes so you can have church. You, we all know that the church is made up of males and females. And, and, and males and females. Go for both of them. Males and females. You want to present yourself decent. You don't want to be a sex symbol. Male and female. Now, a person may lust after you anyway. Some folk would lust after you if you came to church dressed in a barrel. A barrel with straps on the shoulders. They would still look at you funny. But you ought not to help them, though. Say, amen. Oh, my. Uh, I know what you're saying now. You, you're, saying, you're saying, Pastor, you done gone from... You, you were doing all right. Now you done going to meddling. There must be a standard. Let's, let's look first at what uh, walk worthy of the vocation wherein you call mean. Here Paul moves from the subject of spiritual privileges. When you study Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, verse 12, verse 14 through 19, time won't allow me to read these passages to you, but you can read them in your leisure. You will see that he, these scriptures deal with the privileges that the believer has just because we are believers. But now he's moving from privileges to the Christian calling. Walk worthy. For Paul, there was always a, a harmony. There was always harmony between doctrine and ethics. There is what we know. And then there's, there's got to be a harmony between what we know about God and how we live for the Lord. Faith was not isolated in Paul's mind from practice. See, it was... It has become popular to know the faith. But have you noticed it's becoming increasingly po uh, less popular or unpopular to practice the faith? But with Paul, uh, knowing the faith and practicing the faith were not isolated. Walk worthy literally means live worthy of the calling. If we're called to lofty positions in Christ, and the loftiest position in Christ that you can be called to is that of a servant. Amen. So if we're all called to be servants of Christ, then we're to live worthy of that calling. The dominant theme until now of the book of, uh, uh, until chapter 4, the dominant theme of Ephesians was the position into which grace had lifted us. Grace lifted the believers to an exalted place in Christ. But from here on, from chapter 4 on, Paul is teaching on the practical walking out of that position. We are saved by grace. Grace puts us in some fantastic places in Christ but on a, in a practical day-to-day -day, uh, uh, level, we still got to walk this thing out. And we got to live this thing. An amen belongs in there. Our exalted standings in Christ calls for a corresponding godly life. I'm told that, uh, I don't know, that many who heard the minister... Uh, and I'm not preaching about that f funeral, uh, the Reverend Jasper Williams, he upbraided uh, the black community. And many were angry with him for the things that he said, but you have to admit, uh, he was right. How can we say that black lives matter when nobody is going to the abortion clinic clinics to exterminate black lives 
like our men and our women. How can we say black lives matter and shoot each other down in the streets? And you have to admit he had a point when he said it will never matter. It can't matter. It shall not matter until we first stop killing one another. Now, I don't see why anyone would take umbrage with that. Because that's the truth. You can't expect people to respect you more than you respect yourself. We can't expect the Hispanics, the, the whites, the Asians, and others to have a respect for us that we do not demonstrate that we have for each other. Amen. You are my brothers and sisters. We should not be killing each other. We should not be fighting each other down, uh, killing each other in the streets. We receive fierce uh, resentment and rejection and opposition from even those who look like us because we fight that little babies in the womb that will grow to look like us if they're given a chance that they just be a chance be given a chance to be born to be born and there is no, nothing no organization nothing that has, has, that has exterminated the, uh, had decimated and wiped out black lives like planned parenthood. And most of all of the political uh, people that we support, that we vote for, are, in, uh, are people who support funding for planned parenthood and that organization is killing us. If black lives truly matter, black people would demand of our politicians, of our preachers, of those who represent us. I don't know why we need so much representation. I represent me. Of those who represent us, we would demand that they at least represent policies that allow us to be born. If black lives truly matter. See, you can't, you can't have a confrontation with the police if you're not allowed to be born. You can't make the NFL. You can't grow up. You can't be a preacher. You can't start a family. It all starts with birth. Oh, you don't hear me. We must put emphasis on godly conduct. It was said uh, in the 70s. Uh, he's dead today, but Monaghan was right. He said that all of the games that the African-American community have gained uh, during the 60s through civil rights. Those gains are in trouble. They're, of, uh, they, they, they're in jeopardy by the uh, indecent, immoral lifestyle of the black community. Because he was white, many of our leaders accused him of being racist. And at that time, 25% uh, of black kids were born into single parent families. Today, 73% of black kids are born to single parent families. And most of our woes in society, especially the problem that we have in our, in our community, stems from people, the majority of them, who were born in families where they had no daddy. Where, you don't hear me, well, where pop was missing. Single parent, because let me tell you something. The, the man was right. There's one thing that a single mother cannot teach a boy to be. She cannot teach him to be a man. For you cannot go where you've never gone or where you've never been. God bless James Henry Turner. I thank God for him because at 16, by the time I got to where my mama's whoopings didn't hurt no more. And now I'm superior to her in strength. And her, her, her threats had little effect because I'm a 16-year-old full of testosterone, full of life, and full of myself. I met the late, great James Henry Turner and he introduced me to Jesus. Had that not happened, my life would be very different than what it is today. There must be an emphasis on conduct. Conduct.
conduct. You got to know how young black boy, young uh, brother, young sister, how to conduct yourself. The world is not yours. The rules, they don't end with you. Praise the Lord. You ain't going to get no special consideration. Neither should you have any. Learn the rules. Learn how to live and live it. And you'll be blessed of God and highly favored. Paul says, uh, I want to talk about godly conduct. I'm not getting the amen today. Walk worthy uh, is about the unity in the church. Purity in our personal life. Harmony in the home. Yes, it is. Stability in our combat with the powers of evil. That's what the rest of Ephesians is all about. Tells the wife to submit herself to her own husband. Tell the husband to love the wives as Christ loves the church. That's harmony in the home. He speaks to the stability in combat. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world. Are you with me? He speaks to us. He tells us he walk worthy moves from the church belief statement to the church's mission statement. Our behavior must be worthy of our divine calling. And this we can do because of what Jesus did. He says in verse 2, he says, And do it with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering and uh, forbearing uh, one another in love. And, and from a technical standpoint, verse 2, uh, he was really speaking to uh, the Jews in the church because the Jews in the church at uh, Ephesus uh, were arrogant because they felt that they were the center of God's salvation. And so, uh, in a broad sense, verse 1 through 8, was he was speaking to the Jews. And if you notice, in verse 17 through 31, he begins in verse 17 speaking mainly to the Gentiles. Those of us who have been in Christ for a minute, we have to be patient with those who have just come in. We serve with lowliness and meekness. It's never good for an experienced believer to break the heart or be mean or cruel to a babe in Christ. No matter what position you hold, the higher you are, the higher you are ranked, the sweeter you ought to be. Amen. We don't serve with meanness. You don't you don't show kindness at the at some at the expense of somebody's dignity. We serve with pleasure. God bless my mama. Bless your mama. We serve, amen, with gladness. And we, we are grateful, remembering that all of us had to grow. All of us had to develop. None of us are the saint that we are today. None of us was that way then. And thank God for all of those who had patience with us. Amen. There's a lowliness. Somebody say lowliness. There's a lowliness and meekness. And look, it says long suffering. That is, forbear one another. Put up with one another. All right, your brother stumbled. Call him. All right, your sister messed up. Reach out and put your arms around him. Praise the Lord. They fell short. Don't bury the wounded. Give them time to come around. If you don't know how, to correct someone in decency with love and with privacy, do this for me. Leave them alone. We'll get to them. We'll get to them. See, there is, there is a righteous judgment that is often found among godly people. Because we, uh, because we figured out how to get it right, we feel like now we've earned the right to say anything to anybody any kind of way. But what you end up doing is running people off. And they never mature because, uh, no more, you're not the pastor. And you came too hard. You remember. You remember. You remember when you came to Christ. All of us remember how we were messed up. All of us remember how we, we were messed up and had dropped the ball. Praise the Lord. We're saved now. We have lofty titles now. But we came as we were. 
We came single parents. We came lost. We came. We just we just been set free from incarceration. We came, just walked out of an adulterous affair. We came. I mean, all kinds of sin. We came to Jesus, and Jesus took us in. Jesus washed us in the blood and sweetly saved us. And then after we got saved, we still didn't know how to live it and we messed up, we dropped the ball, but there were patient saints. Saints who knew how to say, come on, you can make it. Amen, you get your feelings hurt. A saint see you and your feelings are hurt. A good saint won't see you with your feelings hurt and laugh at you. It ain't funny. They they go put their arms around baby. They didn't they didn't mean anything by it. They, they didn't mean any harm. Praise her. Come on, come on back to church. We got service tonight. I'll help you with it. Then you go to the saint. You go to the person who who calls the offense and say, "Listen, you hurt so and so." Oh well, I didn't mean to. Well, I, I I I don't think you meant to. But here's what you need to do. You need to fix it. Go to them. Go to them and and and, and know how to apologize. Let me teach you how. If what I said to you hurt you, you just misunderstood me. It wasn't me. It was you. And if it hurt you, I'm sorry. But you need to, you need to be able to take something. No, no. You need to know how to apologize. You need to know how to go up to them and say, listen, I was harsh. I was harsh. I was over the top. In my heart, I meant no harm. But I caused harm. Please forgive me. You know what? That person will respect you from now on. Oh, you have won a brother and you are a sister. But quick up. But if you treat it like no, you just misunderstood me. Everybody misunderstood. Everybody ain't misunderstanding you. It could be that you're mean. It could, it could be that you need to be mellowed out. It could be that you need to be washed in the blood. Could be that you need a little long suffering. Could be that you need a little patience. I feel like preaching today. So he told them, I got to move fast. He told them lowliness. Lowliness. This is for the position holders. This is for those of us who have stature. Will somebody in this church patience, forbearing, forbearance, Lowliness. Oh, you, you can find the scriptures now, but those of us who've been saved for a while, we remember when you couldn't find it. We remember when you were looking for revelations in the, fir- in the front part of the Bible. We remember. And we remember how some good, nice saint just reached over and politely helped you find it. The last book in the Bible. And, uh, and you were looking in the front. In Genesis, they helped you find it and, and, and didn't embarrass you. You were struggling when you came in and you needed a little help, you needed a little money to get by. They, 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 they let you hold something and didn't tell 50 people. That's right. you go. Yeah. You go. Nah, nah. Oh, everybody know. <laughs> and that's why you didn't get a reward for it. Because when you do your arms, you do it in secret. And the Father who sees in secret we reward you openly. I'm preaching good. You don't like me today. But I'm pre- I, didn't, I didn't intend to spend this much time on this. But, it, but it, takes, it takes forbearing one another in love. Because you got to want, if you love your brothers and sisters, you want your brothers and sisters to make it. Hey man, if you love your wife, you want her to make it. How you gonna, how you gonna love your wife and, and keep her from going to church? How, wife, how you gonna love your husband and keep him from going to church? How are you going to love your brother and sister in the Lord and run them away from each other and don't even, don't even check on them no more? Well, I just thank God that I'm saved myself. No, you need to be saved because love makes us concerned with each other's welfare. When you're growing right, you don't walk around the church like you're proud as a peacock. Above everybody that's no, there's a humility. And again, the higher you rank, well, is he talking to me? Do you have rank? If you got rank, you on this platform? Yeah, I'm talking to you. The higher you go, the sweeter you ought to be. 
the more kind you ought to be. The, amen. The more accommodating you ought to be because God has elevated you. He said, with lowliness and meekness and long suffering, for, forbearance, tolerance. They don't quite know how to bathe yet. Sitting beside them and you detect something. You don't get up and move. You 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 you, you smell underarm before your own. You don't get up and move. No 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 no. You don't insult the person like that. Help him. No how. Come here, baby. Let me talk to you. Come here. All right. She don't have on. She got on a nice little skirt. Came to church so happy, but. You know, maybe wasn't a mama around or nobody, and no slip. Every oh, you you almost see through it. You you don't walk up to me, just throw a towel around. Me. <laughs> Put the present on the spot. You come here, come here right now. You no 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 no. No, you know how. You know how to. You know how to. You even in the right tone. I want I want to help you. I want to bless you, because I'm afraid. Well well well. How do I need? Well, what do I need to be blessed with? Let me, let me tell you. And, you. and you use. See, you can't talk to people in the same tone and manner that you preach to people. Because when you preach, you're preaching to a crowd. And, 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 and you're talking to everybody. But when you are talking to a person, you're dealing with an individual. And there has to be love and, and, a, and a soft application so that the person will come back and grow because God, God takes umbrage. God pays attention to how you treat the least of these. See, Bible does teach that you ought to treat the elder uh, that ruleth well with double honor, but how to treat the pastor, that's not the only thing that's in the Bible. It's also in the Bible on how we ought to treat each other. The Bible also talks about how we ought to treat the least of thee. Can I get a witness? All of it is in the Bible. So, so y'all had the devil in you. See me come. Oh, bitch. Bitch. Hey, Bishop, got the devil in you. As soon as you leave, then you go back. And folk, folk looking at you, they, they, can't, they, they, don't, they can't believe the transformation. How fast it was made and how short it lasted. How brief it was. There, there has to be holiness. Let, let me move on. He says, because I won't, I won't move, I've been here too long. I got to, I got, I, I got to preach the rest of it. In, in endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. That is, work hard. You, you, those of you, he, he's speaking to everybody, but mainly to the Jews at this point. But the point is, those of us who are uh, in the positions of authority, we're, we're the main ones who should work hard to keep the unity of the spirit. That's why everybody who's in a position ought to line up with the leader. See, you know what the leader's agenda is? That's, that, that's, that's the starting part of your un point of the unity. So the leaders line up, say we work hard uh, to, uh, to keep the unity of the spirit and the belt that is applied, the belt, the belt is the bonds of peace. And bonds of peace is a reference to man's relationship with man. You don't want to be the kind of person who everywhere you go, there's an explosion between you and people. There, there's, a, there's an argument. There's a tool. Man. It's always something with you and somebody. That's not keeping the, the spirit, the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. It takes effort to maintain peace. It's just, just like driving a car. It takes no effort whatsoever to hit a tree. All you got to do is just turn the wheel loose. The car will find the tree and, and will find the biggest one. The car, the car knows how. So watch this. Boom. Takes no effort to keep the car to, to drift into the other lane. It takes effort to prevent those things. It takes no effort for us to divide. 
But staying together as a church requires intentionality. We got to want this. Got to want peace. Want the church, I can't get any help, to be a strong organism and a strong organization. Takes effort to keep the harmony on the choir. All you have to do to have this harmony is to just turn loose the wheel. And people will start fighting. It's the nature of human beings. But God have called us. And we can do this because of what Christ did. God have called us. My God, to keep it together. What are you doing to keep harmony in your home? What are you doing? Husband? What are you doing, wife? To keep the house with one accord. Praise the Lord. Or does everything have to go your way. Somebody give me a somebody give me a pen. I guarantee you, if I drop it, you hear boom. It's so quiet in here, you won't say amen. But the question, what are you doing? To keep your home together. What kind of leadership? What kind of leader are you? What kind of leader are you? What kind of peace? Is there peace in your home? And what do you call peace? Peace is not the absence of argument. Just because she learned to just not say anything else, that don't mean there's peace. One of the worst songs ever written. Ever, 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 ever. Because the man was guilty of doing everything that he tried to accuse his wife of, or the woman. I don't know if they were married or not. Oh, don't get excited. If I come home a little late at night, because we're just arguing like children and fuss and fight, <laughs> if you don't know me by now. I said to myself, well, don't come home a little late at night. <laughs> See, we, you could easily solve that one. Don't tell her not to argue that you're coming home late. Stop coming home late. That solves the problem. Now, if you don't know me by now, you'll never, ever know me. Well, do you know her? It's, a, it's, a, it's two sides. Oh, they don't like my preaching today. I, hey, I'm striking out today. It's two sides. Worst song ever written. I'm going to do my own thing. Do what pleases me. Operate the way I want to. Let me tell you something, ladies. This will help you. If you got to be separated from everybody who loved you before you met him, to have him, that's a sign you shouldn't marry him. You, you, got to, you got to fall out with your mama, your daddy, your friends, people who helped you, people who were kind to you, people who've been there for you, for that ninja. If you got to do all that for him, that's a sign. That he's bad news, and you ain't gonna go nowhere with that Negro, that, 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 that person, that person, that person, that person, that person. Say amen, that person. It slipped out. But you know what didn't slip out, because you know, you know, you know what, <laughs> praise God. Mm -hmm. So, you got to keep peace. <laughs> and, uh, and he gave the reason why we need to keep peace. He said, because uh, there is one body. Yes, and one spirit, one Holy Spirit. Even as you are called in one hope of your call. All of us want to see Jesus in peace. All of us want to be with Jesus in the end. All of us are trying to get to heaven. All of us are trying to obey God. So since that's the case, since that's the case now, if, that, if that's true, then that's, that there is one body, one spirit, 
and, uh, and in one uh, hope of our calling, and then there ain't but one Savior, one Lord. That's Jesus Christ. Ain't but one Lord. And uh, one faith, and that faith operates on the inside. That faith is our doctrine, what we believe in Jesus Christ. Then there is one baptism. The baptism is the outward sign of the inward faith. The world needs to see us, need to know that we've been baptized. The baptism is to salvation what the wedding band is to marriage. The wedding band says to everybody, I'm married. It is not, it is not the wedding, it is not the marriage, but it is the sign that you have been, that you are married. That's why you wear your band. For those who do. It is, it is the statement. Now, I ain't looking at nobody's hands. It is the statement. It, it, yeah, it, it is. It's the, it's the statement. Say amen. Praise the Lord. Ah, uh, but it is not the wedding. It is not the marriage. It is the baptism. It's the outside show the statement to the world. Can I get a witness? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. Where there is a people, as I said not long ago, you will find God because the Lord loves souls. He made people, and he wants to save everybody. Now, with all this being true, time to go home now. Let me work hard at landing this plane with all this, these uh, directives being given to us to stay together, keep the church unified, do it in the bonds of peace, love one another, forbear one another. Then the big one, walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. How are we expected to do this? Well, before I get there, I do want to talk about our grace. Verse 7 says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. I thank God for my grace gift. And this grace here is saving grace. Thank you, Jesus. And God gives grace in general, but he hands out grace in particular. Some people have been given, and Jesus knows, because it's, it's his gift. Jesus knows, bless you. Jesus knows how much gift, grace to give. Some people have been given a whole lot of grace. They've messed up 10,000 times and still drinking. But God is still giving them a chance. Some people missed the boat one time, and they went into judgment. God knows. God knows. Say, that doesn't seem fair. You're not God. God knows. There were some people who were in the club uh, that night, and the, the, the bullet missed you, but it got them. He gave you grace. Their grace was up. God knows. He meads out grace. Now, nobody knows how much grace that they have. This is why you don't want to frustrate the grace of God. You don't want to nullify because the grace can run out. Yeah. Amen. So, some of them brothers that you see on uh, uh, Spectrum News locked up those mug shots. They ran out of grace. They thought they were going to get away, break it in that time. And now they can still be saved. But the point is, they, they probably have done that multiple times, but it ran out. Are you following what I'm saying? See, God have given you grace. Don't play with it. Be grateful. I thank the Lord that he gave me time to get right. And uh, I took advantage of that grace. Jesus meads out the grace. He died for all, but he deals with us all uh, in particular as individuals. Good God Almighty. So with this grace... He says here, wherefore he saith, 
when he ascended on high. One of the things that I said that Jesus did was his ascension. To ascend means to go back to heaven. Acts of the Apostles. I feel this. Chapter 1. Let's look at for a minute here the ascension. Amen. Acts 1 and verse 9 says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, uh, taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Can you imagine this? Jesus, he had just finished tell, telling them, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost have come upon you. This is after his resurrection. After he's been raised from the dead. Now, he's going back to heaven. Bible says he was received uh, uh, out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go up into heaven. Everybody say the ascension. Just for another passage, will you turn right quick to Luke's gospel? Praise the Lord. Uh, chapter 24 and uh, verse 50 says, and he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up uh, his hands and he blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them. I know how he blessed them. He told them, man, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost have come upon you. While he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. So now we see Paul writing about this event. And as Paul writes about the ascension, he says that he ascended. Notice what it says, verse 8. Wherefore, when he ascended on high, when Jesus ascended, he went to heaven to be with God the Father. Now, this whole passage is Paul quoting from uh, uh, Psalms 68 and verse 18. Psalm 68 and 18 prophesied about the Messiah. It says, thou hast ascended on high, and thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, uh, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell among them. This passage is a prophecy that the Messiah would ascend to heaven and would conquer his foes uh, after he conquered his foes and lead his foes captive. He would defeat his foes, leave them captive, lead them captive, and as a reward for his victory, he would receive from God the Father gifts to give to men. And not only did he, in the verse 18 of, of uh, Psalm 68, conquer uh, his enemies, but he also even conquered the rebellious also. You see that even uh, from the rebellious he would receive gifts because Jesus conquered the enemy. And so now Paul is picking up on that theme and said, wherefore, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Good God Almighty. And gave gifts unto men. Jesus defeated the devil. Jesus uh, defeated the enemy. God, thank you, Jesus. In the ascension, the glorified, victorious Jesus went back to heaven. And uh, when he went back to heaven, verse 3, uh, this verse says that he gave gifts uh, to men. And the gifts are ministry gifts. 
And uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But when he went up to heaven, he gave us gifts. Now notice this. Follow me in this because God is saying something to us. And I don't want you to miss it. He makes uh, miss these points. He says in verse 9, now he that ascended, uh, what is it that he also descended? Now, when he talked about Jesus ascending, that is going back, he wants to make the point that before he could ascend, the ascension of Christ, going back to heaven, he had to first descend. Good God Almighty. That is, the descension deals with the incarnation of Christ. Incarnation means to come in the flesh. John 1 and 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Philippians uh, chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be made to be equal with God. Watch the, praise the Lord, uh, the incarnation. He says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in the fashion as a man being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even to the death of the cross look at the uh, incarnation of Christ he left heaven to come down to us and then Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 says, And the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Uh, when as his mother Mary was exposed by, while she was engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found of a child of the Holy Ghost. God came down, wrapped himself in flesh. God took on the form of, of a man. This is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So I'm working, Paul works backwards. He starts with the ascension. But he said, wait a minute. He that ascended, don't get it confused. See, because he wanted him to know that the same one who ascended is the one who descended. Because the word was out that when Jesus died, that Jesus stayed dead. No, sir. The same Jesus who died on the cross. The same Jesus who ascended up to heaven is the same Jesus that came down here with Mary and was found in Mary. And notice what it says here. So now we have the ascension. We have the descension. Now let's deal with the resurrection. Notice what it says in our text, he says concerning our Lord and Savior, now he that ascended is the same one that descended. But notice why he descended to. He descended into the lower parts of the earth. Lower parts of the earth here is an analogy to the grave. Jesus died. He died on the cross. Jesus didn't just pass out, but Jesus died. Praise the Lord. He hung his head and died. He cried out, it is finished. And he died. And when he died, the Bible tells us where his spirit went. Because Jesus said it himself. Luke picked it up. The folk want to know where did Jesus go when he died. Well, the Bible tells us where he went when he died. Uh, Jesus tells us where he went. When he died, Jesus said in Luke's gospel chapter 23 and verse 43, and Jesus said unto him, said to the thief on the cross, verily I say unto thee uh, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then when Jesus actually passed away in verse 46, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he gave up the ghost. Well, Jesus' spirit went to be with his father. And his body was taken to the grave. But Paul said in the text, he that ascended, hallelujah, went up, is the same one that came down. Well, between the ascension 
and between the dissension, there had to have been a resurrection if he was still the same man, hallelujah, all the time, then for him to come down and get into the flesh and then go back up to heaven and for him to be raised from the dead, then that means that he had to have died. And when he died, then God had to raise him from the dead. Well, because of the ascension, because of, praise the Lord, the dissension and because of the resurrection Jesus made it possible for every believer to live the life on resurrection Sunday uh, Mary hallelujah and Mary Magdalene and all of the women they came to the tomb looking for the body of Jesus and instead of finding Jesus they found an angel they found an empty tomb they found out that Jesus wasn't there. He had been raised from the dead. The Bible said uh, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, to see the sepulchre. And instead of finding Jesus, they found an angel. And that angel told them, why do you seek the living? among the dead don't you remember what he told you that three days later he would rise again he's no longer here said go and meet him in Galilee how many are glad today that Jesus is alive that Jesus is real so Paul said to them based on these things based on the incarnation he came in the flesh based on the resurrection. He died and was, and was raised from the dead. And based on the ascension, he has given us power to conquer the devil. He has given us power to live this life. I'm just like the songwriter who said, because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives. Good God Almighty, all my fear is gone because I know he holds the future. Life is worth living because he lives. How many can say today, my life is worth living because Jesus lives. Because Jesus lives and he's given gifts. He said, go, go to the upper room and stay there until you be endued with power from on high and I heard Acts say when the day of Pentecost had fully come they were in the upper room with one accord and suddenly there came the sound of a rushing mighty wind oh, Lord it Suddenly, the wind came in, and then the wind transformed and began to look like fire. And the fire set upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues. Yeah, the Holy Ghost gives us power to live holy. The Holy Ghost gives us power to walk worthy of the vocation wherein you call. The Holy Ghost gives us power to cast devils out. The Holy Ghost gives us power to speak a new language, to lay hands on the sick and they recover. The Holy Ghost gives us power to cast out demons and devils. Wow! Oh, the Holy Ghost gives us power to walk on serpents and scorpions. The Holy Ghost. Oh, somebody praise the Lord for the gift of the Holy Ghost.
praise the Lord for your spiritual gifting. Woo! I want you to encourage your neighbor and tell him you can make it. You can do it. You can do it. I know the devil is beating on you. I know the enemy is trying to stop you. I know he's throwing everything at you. But the kitchen sink. I know that the odds are against you. But that's all right. You have the power. You have the power. Not only is the Holy Ghost to give, but he gave, yes sir, he gave some apostles. He gave some prophets. He gave some evangelists. He gave some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why don't you let God edify you today? Let the Holy Ghost build you up. Let the Spirit of God revive your spirit because I'm here to tell you that there ain't no stopping us now. Good God Almighty, I feel more determined today than I did when I started 41 years ago. I believe it today, more so today than I did when I first got started. We serve a God. He's a mighty good God. We serve a God. He'll get you out. And if there's anybody, if you're in a jam and you need deliverance, I want you today to praise the Lord like it's already done because I'm here to tell you that it is. It just hadn't been manifested in the flesh yet, but it's done. And the Lord is giving us power to walk worthy of our vocation. Power to walk worthy of being called into the ministry power to walk worthy of being a missionary power to walk worthy of being an ordained elder power to walk worthy to sing the praises of the lord power Anybody excited about living it? Anybody excited about living it? Why? How can I? How can I do these things? It's because of what Jesus did. Because He came. Because He wrapped Himself up in flesh because he walked this earth and went to the lower parts of the earth and because God the Father didn't let him see corruption God Almighty but raised him from the dead and then about 10 days or so later while talking to the disciples while talking to him while talking they're looking at him. And he seemed almost to be getting taller. He wasn't getting any taller. They were taking him up. Looked down. And a cloud came all around his feet. And he's going up. And on his way back, on his way out of here, he told him, Lord! Ah, oh, Lord! I know you see me leaving. I know you see me leaving. I know you see me going up, but believe what I tell you, Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Yeah, somebody will lift your hands and say, I've got Jesus. He'll never leave me alone. He's with me right now. Yes, he is. Give God praise. For the presence of God. Oh Lord. Woo! I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Through the storms of life. I'm with you. 
And I'll enable you to walk worthy of this. It's a privilege to be in this. It's a privilege to be in the Lord's church. It's a privilege to be holy. It's a privilege to name the name of Christ. It's a privilege, it's a privilege, it's a privilege, it's a privilege. It's a privilege that you should value more than anything else. And so since we have this privilege, now let's walk it out. Let's walk it out. Let's live where the community will know that we're saved. Let's operate where the co-workers will know that we're saved. Let's live so the family will know that we're saved. Let's carry ourselves in such a manner. And why am I going? Why? How can I do it? Because of what Jesus, Jesus did. Ascension, incarnation, and resurrection. Proper order, incarnation, resurrection, and ascension. And I got one more. He's coming back. Somebody ought to get happy. Somebody ought to get happy. What are these are days? What are these are days? The Lord, the Lord, He's coming back to get us, and I'm gonna be ready, ready. Do I have anybody here today who's striving to be ready? Ready. Ready, ready, ready for what? Ready to walk in Jerusalem. Just like John. Talk in Jerusalem. Just like John. Ready to put on my long white robe. Yeah, Lord. Ready. 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 So the battles that we fight down here, they're nothing. It's a privilege. There's a crown, there's a robe, there's a mansion waiting, waiting. This knowledge enables us to walk worthy. This knowledge, these gifts, the church, the prophets, the preachers, the ministry gifts, if you take advantage of them, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Ghost, gives us power to do these things. Somebody is struggling today with these things. Somebody is struggling. Somebody, somebody, somebody is struggling. Today is your day. I told you today is a day of victory. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is our keeper. Jesus is our shade upon our right hand. <laughs> he protects us from the heat of the sun. Heard him say, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, often my, our sermons deal with us standing for the Lord and fighting for him. But I want to, want to remind you today that he's standing for you. Amen. And that this is a privilege, and he wants every one of us to walk it out. If you're here today and you're struggling with walking it out, you need the Lord's help. You want the Lord's strength. You want the Lord to touch you and give you power to be that man that God is calling for, to be that woman that the Lord is calling for, to be that person whom God is calling. You want to be the Lord's daughter. You want to be that, 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 that on fire teenager for Christ. That, that on fire young man for Jesus. You want to be that person. You want to be that on fire husband. That on fire wife. You want to be that person. Paul says walk worthy of the vocation wherein ye are called. We can do it because of what Jesus did. If you're here today and the word of God is speaking to you. Meet me quickly at the altar and I want to pray.